If you've been on Mars, you know that Promise Keepers are coming to St. Louis July 18th and 19th. Saw in Saturday's paper that uh, 45,000 men have already signed up. I was at the uh, press conference at the Dome on Friday at uh, 1. We have uh, William Davey on the line, conference coordinator for uh, Promise Keepers, Missouri State Representative. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, coming out. Thanks for joining us. What attracted you to Promise Keepers? Well, uh, what attracted me was once again a being a Christian for a number of years and knowing that as a Christian man, I can't do my best without having relationships with other men. Mm -hmm. uh, having been a discipler and, and a minister uh, since my college days, I often saw the need uh, for mentoring and uh, discipling relationships amongst men. And it's, uh, it's kind of a hurtful thing to be in a church or, or to be a Christian and not be able to say that you have a best friend mm -hmm. or someone that is mentoring you or coming alongside of you uh, to help you walk this Christian walk. And so uh, there's just always been a need uh, for men to come together. And uh, that's why Promise Keepers has come about, I believe. Now, you are on the front lines, obviously, being uh, one of the high-ups here in Missouri. Uh, why don't you share some of the, the things that you have seen, the, the good things, uh, some of the success stories, people being brought to Christ or, or uh, marriages uh, coming together, whatever it is that, that, uh, that, that, is, that is the most impressive to you. Okay, well... Uh, I'll go back to this weekend. I'd like to say uh, good morning to my friends at uh, Friendly Temple uh, Baptist Church and um, Central Presbyterian. The men from those two churches got together for fellowship Saturday morning. Uh, black men, white men, Hispanic brothers together, uh, not just for a show, but to start relationships with one another, to actually learn from one another, to become sensitive, to possibly find a prayer partner uh, of a man of a different culture. Uh, Saturday night, we were at World Impact in St. Louis with uh, men from First E Free in Manchester and men from uh, ministries in the city such as Jubilee, uh, Christian, and Transformation. And those men, uh, it was multiracial, multicultural, uh, together starting relationships uh, in song and prayer and worship and praise uh, and praying together in small groups. And so those are some of the things that are just most exciting I was with a group called the Reconcilers last week. Uh, of the ministry started because some of the uh, men had attended a Promise Keeper event a couple of years ago and decided to come to come home to St. Louis and try to do something about uh, racial reconciliation and uh, reconciliation with cultures in the St. Louis area. So those are some of the things that are, are happening that are just great. Uh, I can say personally speaking that Promise Keepers has, has made me uh, has influenced me, uh, rather, uh, to be a better husband and a better father and, and uh, not just run away from my responsibilities, uh, even a, in a religious sense, uh, and many other men that I know. What would your wife say? What would my wife say? Yeah. Well, she, she would say that, that I am a, a committed husband and a committed father, and not that I, I, I was not before uh, Promise Keepers, uh, but, but that I am and, and that I continue to uh, do my best to be the best husband and father that I can be. One of the, the big uh, pluses for Promise Keepers, I think, is the, the push on racial reconciliation. Why do you think it's taken the church so long to get around to this, Bill? Well, I think because the, the church uh, has been in large part run by men, and we have that tendency to isolate ourselves as men. And I think if you have a tendency to isolate yourself, you, you look... And you say, how can I isolate? How can I separate? And one of the easiest things to do is to look at the uh, color of a man's skin. One of the easiest things to do is look at the uh, culture or look at his speech and language or look at his uh, economic status. And we have uh, decidedly, or if he doesn't agree with me theologically, and we decide to put up barriers and walls between ourselves. Do you think it's more important for men to become good daddies and good fathers and for families to be healed? Or do you think it's more important for that man and that family to become born again, to have the assurance of, of salvation? In, in the context of that question, there is no good without God. Mm -hmm. I, I am 100% uh, sure of that. I was a well-intentioned uh, young person 
uh, but I was still uh, on my way to hell, basically. Right. And so the first commitment of a promise keeper is to come to know Jesus Christ, to honor Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and to worship Him. And so uh, before we can have any fruit as being men of God, we must first know God ourselves. Mm -hmm. So there is no being a good dad, good husband, uh, and such like unless we first know Jesus Christ. We need that power within us. That, that's number one, without right. a doubt, no, no way of looking at it. Okay. Now, we're going to talk with Phil Arms because he doesn't have a whole lot of time to, to, to share with us this morning. Okay. Shall I put you on hold, or do you want to try to call back later? I, I want to get your response to what he says. Oh. Uh, shall I put you on hold? I, I guess you can put me on hold. How? And, and if you get disconnected or something, well, we can bring you in every few minutes or so to get your response. How about, a, how about that? Okay. Can we do that? All right. All right. We'll continue with uh, William Davey, conference coordinator for Promise Keepers and the Missouri State Representative here in just a few minutes. But we're going to get to Phil Arms, uh, who has another perspective, and uh, that's coming up in just a minute. He's the author of Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse. We'll find out why he's calling his book that. Phil Arms is uh, pastoring in Houston, Texas these days. For the past decade, he's been in the ministry now for 25 years. He's conducted city and area-wide crusades across America. Millions have been introduced to uh, his impacting ministry through his weekly television program seen across the United States and beyond. He's been on uh, TBN a number of times. Phil Arms, good morning. Welcome to Mornings with Tim and Al. Good morning, and uh, it's a real privilege to be with you guys. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse. Why did you... Uh, why did you name your book that? Well, first, if I may, just let me say, uh, we are uh, never trying under any circumstances to uh, assault or demean the character of uh, those very uh, sincere men who are at the helm of that organization, and certainly many who are participating in it, and uh, not our intention at all to question the motives. Quite frankly, some of the most uh, committed men I know are a part of this organization, as far as their desire to see God do something. And uh, we rejoice that every time there's a redemptive act or move of God anywhere, and when people get saved, as they often do at their big rallies, uh, we praise the Lord for that. However, our, our concern uh, began as a pastor several years ago when the organization Promise Keepers began to take a, a foothold, and people in our church began to come and ask me um, about it. We have a very sizable church. And as a pastor and shepherd, I'm given the God-given uh, responsibility of being that spiritual buffer zone, if you would, for, for our flock and the cover of protection. And taking that very seriously, I uh, began to study the intricacies of the organization. Didn't have to go very far before we got uh, very concerned about the uh, technique, the agenda, the assumption of the mandate that they call upon themselves and say that it is a God-given mandate, and the anti-biblical, unscriptural approach of uh, the mentoring techniques that are employed by the organization. Mm -hmm. I originally just did a series on television. Uh, actually, I did it on a Wednesday night in our church, and we had the television cameras running with a, a little sub-crew that was in training, but weren't intending to put it on television. and. Uh, so we had a technical problem with our program the next week, and all we had in the can, so to speak, is what they call it, that was this program. So we ran it, and uh, the response was phenomenal. People wanted to know more. So we wrote the book. It's kind of a local deal. And then it's taken off around the nation, and we're going into our third printing. It's been the most uh, phenomenal and uh, tasking of thing I've ever done. Several times I wouldn't, I wish I wouldn't have written a book because it's, uh, it's uh, created such a, a workload for us. But uh, it's a needed book. And it, uh, it answers the question of why godly men should not, under any circumstances, be affiliated with this organization. Now, let's, let's talk about the statement of faith here for a minute. How does the uh, Promise Keepers statement of faith differ from that of uh, other Christian organizations? Well, I took the statement of faith, and we deal with this in the book. And we ran it through a number of organizations, and we list those organizations that could live with that statement of faith. The statement of faith is so generic in its application uh, and so absent of doctrinal clarity that uh, it opens promise keepers to every aberrant religious quasi-Christian group in America. And uh, you add to that the fact that promise keepers in their upper echelons, and this is proven, this fact, even though your guest may deny it, and I don't know how upper echelon he is, but there is no confrontation policy that is uh, down through the ranks taught 
to the PK people as they get into their mentoring groups. We don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable with their particular religious convictions. Hence, the Catholics, uh, even the Mormons, homosexuals, are invited in not under the pretense of conversion, but as a pretend, under the pretense of participation. Now, that has been denied on some occasions, but when the uh, facts are seen clearly in that book, and by the way, we had access to materials Promise Keepers Headquarters didn't know we had, and the people still did not know we had access to, and uh, proved some very bizarre, remarkable uh, facts. And incidentally, a lot of people who were participating in this organization, and almost every pastor that's read that book who was supportive of the organization was so shocked after checking out the facts and the documentation that they've done a 180 and distanced themselves from the organization. I'm sure Bill would like to comment on some of what you've shared. Uh, once again, Bill Davey, conference coordinator for Missouri State uh, uh, the conference coordinator for Promise Keepers and Missouri State Representatives. Bill, you have any comments? Well, uh, I, I haven't read the book, uh, so I'm, I would say I'm at a disadvantage there. Um, but I have been involved since 1994 in the St. Louis area mm -hmm. with Promise Keepers, and that has been an, and I've been involved in the uh, process of uh, training volunteers and training men in the area of men's ministry in their local church. Mm -hmm. And as a um, minister here in St. Louis who belongs to Jesus Christ, I haven't had a problem uh, with the uh, materials and how we help to lead men in the area of men's ministry. Well, let me, let me just respond to that. And, and again, I will, uh, in all due respect, uh, to what, is it Mr. Davies? Yes. Uh, forgive me for not being more familiar with, with this. But my point uh, can be taken up in one of the things that you said at the open concerning mentoring and relationships. I was listening to a PK speaker the other day on a program, and he said this, I have come to believe, as a minister after 20 years of ministering, that men cannot maintain moral purity unless they have accountability with other men. Well, I almost fell out of my chair. Now, that's typical PK reasoning, and it's somewhat in line with what uh, you spoke a while ago. The truth of the matter is, biblically, and that's all that matters here, it doesn't matter what I think or... Uh, Tim and I, I think anybody else thinks. We've got to go from a worldview that is based on the, on Christianity and, and, and the scriptures. And that's all I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about numbers or results or fruit. We're concerned about root. And relationships with other men are not necessary for anybody to walk in the fullness of God's uh, rich, uh, power-controlled, spirit-controlled life. The sufficiency of Christ is in Christ. Our accountability is to him, it is to the indwelling Holy Spirit, and it is to those members of our church and that chain of authority that God has established there. The mentoring process that is employed by the Promise Keepers organization is built upon uh, Freudian and Jungian psychology mixed up with a whole lot of uh, Bible verses trying to justify it. It is not by any stretch of the imagination true biblical discipleship. And uh, when you talk about racial conciliation, and then you look at this, uh, the mandate by Bill McCartney, which says uh, uh, the God-given uh, mandate that we have as promise keepers is to break down the barriers uh, between, and then he goes to this list of things that sound good, uh, racial barriers, cultural barriers, financial barriers, and then he gets to that part where it says, and denominational or sectarian bar uh, barriers. In other words, you look at it and it looks really good, because, you see, we are, none of us are for racial barriers. I, you know, I pastor a church that's uh, far, we have far more blacks in our church than the city does, and it's in proportion to it. But the reason that is is because Jesus Christ, according to Paul, breaks down that middle wall of partition between us. We need no organization to work a reconciliation in what the blood of the Lamb has done and what the power of the Holy Spirit has done. This is a redundancy, just another redundancy. But, but you will admit, Phil, before PK came along, that wasn't really happening. Someone once said the most segregated uh, hour of worship, uh, well, the most segregated hour in America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Well, and and I, I agree there are, are a few churches out there that are uh, uh, integrated, fully integrated, but uh, it has been the exception rather than the rule, right? Well, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, again, my experience would not prove that. And I know a great number of pastors in the Houston area. I think it was true probably in the past. But I think people have, have grown a lot uh, spiritually over the last several years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, again, even if this produces a desired external, externalities 
fruit in the in respect to uh, that kind of thing. You still got to go back and test it against what says the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, when you're trying to accomplish goals, you have to question number one. Is this a God-given goal? And that's what you have to look at when you... Bill McCartney, the founder of Promise Keeper, says, God, we have a God-given mandate to break down these walls between all these groups, and then he says denominational groups. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, God's Word is the, is the entity that established these walls between those denominations that maintain the integrity of the Word of God and doctrinal purity and those who have forsaken it and become apostate and do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and yet... Promise Keepers opens doors to and encourages and solicits and goes after to be a major part of their organization. We don't need to be breaking down walls that are sacred and holy and that millions of people down through the years, including during the Reformation, have shed their blood to defend those walls. Now, give us an example of what, what the walls you're talking about, because there are a lot of folks who they hear uh, break down the walls, but they, they don't know what that means. Well, the walls that uh, they talk about are the walls between the, what he refers to, McCartney refers to, as the body of Christ. Now, when Bill McCartney says the body of Christ, he doesn't mean what, what I mean when I say the body of Christ or what many evangelical uh, pastors or the evangelistic pastors mean when we say the body of Christ. It's much more generic application and a wider application. When we say the body of Christ, we mean those that have subscribed to the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the word of God, the New Testament, Old Testament truths, and the fundamental tenets of the Orthodox Christian faith. In other words, people who have accepted Christ as the only means of salvation by faith through grace. Now, let, let me give you... Tim is, is charismatic. I'm not. Hmm. Uh, I, I have a tendency to, toward Calvinism, but I can get along with, uh, with Arminians. I can get along with, uh, with just about any anybody as long as they have taken Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, and I'm, I'm sure as a pastor for uh, as long a time as, as you have, that, that uh, sometimes God uses us in spite of our theology. Yeah, in spite of and in spite of a lot of things. And, and so, it is, if, uh, from what I understand from Promise Keepers, they're not, uh, they're not excluding, they're, they're not, what am I saying? If you're born again, that's okay with them. Uh, am I am I too yeah, broad? But here's the here's the issue. They have no definitive statement of what it means to be born again. Therefore, therefore, they are open to all of these various religious groups and some cults who claim that they are born again. Well, let me ask Bill this, Bill Davy. Uh, Bill, what happens if a Mormon? goes down front and uh, receives Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Is he sent back to the Mormon ward? Do you know? Uh, no. Um, I guess I, I could speak for having led uh, the area here in St. Louis. We have uh, no Mormon involvement. Mm -hmm. Mormons uh, are not Christians, and uh, they don't agree with our statement of faith. So uh, I, it's, it's a... It's a, a question to me as to which uh, non-Christian groups uh, are involved in Promise Keepers. Well, first off, Mormons are involved, and they're involved heavily, and the Mormon leadership, stake leadership in Utah, has made a public statement that said uh, we are very pleased and we are encouraging our people to attend these Promise Keepers rallies because their statement of faith and goals read something like out of our Book of Mormon. Now, that's in the book. It's documented. They do go, they are solicited, they do make decisions, and they are left in the Mormon church. And the PK people who are in charge of those decisions are encouraged not, encouraged not to pursue getting them out of that cult. You have the same situation with the Catholics. The Catholic church does not believe the Bible, New Testament, gospel, grace message like I believe Mr. Davey probably does, and I do. They do not accept the premise that the Bible is the closed canon. They've written additional scriptures and added certain numbers of works that are necessary for a person to do if he is indeed going to be truly a Christian. Now, let me ask you this, Bill. Fact, uh, they don't even believe uh, that your guest is a Christian or that I'm a Christian because we're non-Catholic, and yet they'll come and sit down under the pretense that... Uh, they are for their own individual agendas and purposes, which they have, we well proved in the book that they have in this organization. Now, Bill, let me just, before you respond, uh, let me just say KJSL St. Louis. Um, 
Bill McCartney, in his book, uh, The Founder of the Promise Keepers, uh, From Ashes to Glory, on page 112, 113, said uh, that he had this born-again experience and he considered himself a born-again Catholic. And then he goes on to say, but he doesn't see uh, where it's necessary for maybe all Catholics to have this experience. Do you agree with that? Do Promise Keepers agree with that? Uh, is that their general statement? Is, uh, well, I, that that all, it's necessary for all Catholics, all Baptists, everybody, to be to have a truly born again John three sixteen experience. Okay, well, our, our statement of faith says we uh, that it should be uh, not born again, not the, the the word born again, but a belief in Jesus Christ through through faith in Jesus Christ uh, alone. So I mean, and therein lies the problem with the promise keepers. They use the terminology and the, and the semantics. And by the way, this man we're talking to is not the one who is guilty of this matter. And so that's why I hate to dialogue in, in this kind of situation with him because it makes him look in a bad light that he is not in that very obviously. But the leadership and the promoters mm -hmm. and, the, and the people who are behind the scenes have so structured their material and their PR material that they can spread a big tent a big tent theology that encompasses large numbers of groups to draw them in to the organization. The tragedy of that is, in fact, I've got a title of one of the chapters in my book called The Baskin Robbins Jesus of the Promise Keepers. You know, that Baskin Robbins ice cream chain always advertised 31 flavors. They're real proud of that. Well, there's at least 31 flavors of Jesus in your average Promise Keepers rally. And everybody's there worshiping Jesus, but you got to ask the question, what Jesus are we worshiping? Is it the Catholic Jesus that says you have to pray to Mary? You have to take uh, the, the, the Eucharist and go through their Mass in order to be a Christian? Or is it the Baptist Jesus, in most cases, that preach the New Testament Gospel? Or is it the Mormon Jesus? Or is it the homosexual Jesus that allows a person to live in perversity and be a Christian? What does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? I mean, there's no definitive statement of what it means to be a Christian, and that's one of the big Biggest problems, and I'll tell you something else very quickly. The, the, even the premise of the, of the seven promises is so antithetical to the Scripture that it defies uh, the imagination. You take those seven promises and you read them, and you think, "Well, those are commendable, commendable things to do." But you see, those seven promises are nothing but redundancies to the to the true Christian life. First, the premise that Christians are to even attempt to make promises in order to become spiritually mature or to become better Christians or better men or men of integrity is anti-Christian and anti-biblical. Now, David said, uh, my vows are ever before you, O Lord. Well, the vows that David made were not the vows that are encompassed in the body of these seven promises. The, the seven promises imply that you are to make these promises and that making these promises you will become the man of integrity. Let me just address that. If we're going to be partakers of God's nature, which is what Christianity is, it's Christ in us. It's not me doing better. It's not me improved. It's all Jesus. First, uh, Second Peter 1, three says we're partakers of his divine nature by the exceedingly great and precious promises that he has made to us. So Promise Keepers promotes a legalistic, uh, works-laden, pseudo-Christianity. I've often told them if they're so fond of keeping promises and rules, why don't they go back to those original ten God gave them in the Old Testament? All right, we'll, look, we'll continue in a minute, and we're going to give uh, Bill a chance to respond to you, uh, Phil. Uh, and we want to open it up for our listeners. Uh, if you have a comment or you would uh, like to ask a question, give us a call, 314-969-6300, 314-969-6300. On the phone with William Davey. Conference Coordinator for Promise Keepers and Missouri State Representative, and Phil Arms, the author of Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse. And Missouri State Representative, and Phil Arms, the author of Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse. We promised uh, Bill a chance to respond to Phil there. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think my first response is simply to say, uh, speaking from the St. Louis area, which is my uh, main involvement, uh, that is is that promise keepers, you know, I don't think we can be responsible for different non-Christian organizations and ministries and churches or what have you that try to come alongside of us uh, to a scripture and uh, make their own interpretation to line up with uh, words or statements that we use or say. And uh, when that happens, um, I can only tell you here is that we don't have a in, you know, inclusion of um, ministries that are non-Christian. So 
that's that's all that I can say. Right. Let's uh, let's go to the telephones. We've got Mark calling from uh, Florissant. Welcome to uh, mornings with uh, Tim and Al and uh, and Bill Davy and Phil Arms. Good morning. Hello, guys. I just wanted to uh, call in. I am a promise keeper here in the St. Louis um, area. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not. I don't have personal contact with anyone with the Promise Keeper uh, national staff. I just know what Promise Keepers has done in uh, my local church and what I see it doing in the St. Louis um, area. Can I be uh, nosy and ask you what your church is? It is uh, Trinity Church of the uh, Nazarene okay. in, uh, up in uh, Florissant. Okay. Um, we've been involved in Promise Keepers for about the last three years. We'll have a group of men attending our third conference on July 18th and uh, 19th. What I can tell you that Promise Keepers has done in our church is to call men to uh, greater um, holiness before God and and before each other. We have worked through the seven promises of a Promise Keeper. From there, we've gone on to to use other uh, materials, both published by Promise Keepers and elsewhere to encourage the men to be true men of God, authentic, according to the Bible. Uh, We have a group that meets once a month for study. We have a Friday uh, men's uh, prayer meeting. We do have several groups, several men that have paired off twos and threes to uh, help hold each other accountable. Our experience in that is that men are opening the Bible and through the encouragement of other men using the Word of God to um, illuminate their own hearts, their own needs, the own places where they are failing in their calling as men of God. And where having two or three men there helps is to encourage, to give insight, uh, to pray for one another, uh, okay. etc. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for your call. All right. Uh, Phil, how do you respond to that? First, let me <clears throat> respond to what Mr. Davies said about they can't be responsible for all the people that come. Uh, I would encourage our church, as well as Promise Keepers, or anywhere that the gospel is preached, to to invite, you know, to seek the need of the physician, obviously. We want, we're not against the evangelization of these groups. We definitely want to reach out. I've done citywide air ride crusades all over the country. I have a television ministry that reaches every segment of society. We want to go after everyone. But the thing that uh, is being dodged by promise keepers is once these people make commitments, they are, they are called immediately, promise keepers is, to the responsibility of articulating to those people truth and the truth of God's word that is in opposition to what these groups have been taught and what they believe. When they get involved in the Promise Keepers mentoring process, if they're following the Promise Keepers material, then I assure you, in all assurance, and the book that I wrote establishes this without doubt, 414 pages and 100 of them are documentation and research. It will prove without doubt that the message, the bottom line message of Promise Keepers is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you've got a man like Bill McCartney, who you just read his own words, doesn't even see the need for all men to be born again, what more does it take for anybody to wake up and smell the coffee? Right, let's go to the Dow Jones mentality that big is better and bigger is best. And what we've got is an organization, Promise Keepers, who's willing to sacrifice the integrity of truth and the word of God and let it be butchered and slaughtered on the altar of unity and on a bigger organization. And it's a tragedy that men who love God, like Mr. Davies and others, that uh, are equally committed to the truth of God and love the Lord and want to see something happen to men, uh, are caught up in this organization. Uh, this caller, just very quickly, uh, said all the things that Promise Keeper's been doing to his church and taking men to the promises. Let me just say this. Any church that's true to the Word of God that is doing what the Word of God tells it to do is already doing far in excess anything Promise Keepers has put on paper to challenge men to be men of God and men of integrity. But is that the message? I mean, is the message of the church that we are trying to make more moral men or better men or men of integrity? My answer to that is, is no. 
the, the message of the church is uh, not that men are immoral mm -hmm. or not that men are even bad. Man's problem isn't that he's just a, not a good guy. His problem is he is dead. And morals and integrity is a satanic counterfeit for the righteousness of God, which only a relationship with Jesus Christ can bring to our life. And when that happens, you don't need anybody keeping you accountable All to right. the holy God who lives in you. All right, we're going to give Bill a chance to respond to that in just a minute. I wanted to take Dave here. Uh, we're calling long distance from Highland, Illinois. And by the way, when the phones, uh, we've, we've got the numbers open here, 314-969-6300. When you call, ring it and let it ring. You know we're here, so just uh, let it ring and uh, we'll pick it up. And as soon as someone hangs up, call again and, and you yep. Be able to get through. All right, go ahead, uh, Dave. Good morning. Welcome to Morning with Tim and Al. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harms's point about slaughtering the truth uh, on the uh, altar uh, of unity and reconciliation is is very well taken. Uh, I've seen uh, a situation in a church I'm familiar with where uh, we have uh, a group of men involved in church leadership that have been very involved in a promise keepers movement, and uh, we have seen where there have been situations in the church that require uh, accountability, uh, both pastoral accountability and congregational accountability, and they have been so bathed in the doctrine of unity that they have gone back and failed to lead within the church body. Um, and I, I can't, I don't know what they're hearing at the promise keepers um, rallies, but I do know that it seems that they are will, unwilling to take the initiative and lead in situations where that initiative be, needs to be taken. And it's because they've been so bathed in this unity at any cost thing that the idea of, uh, of leading uh, practically becomes um, comes anathema to them because they're so bathed in the idea of unity. Yes. Let's uh, let Bill respond to that. Well, I, I think it's pretty strange that we would talk about accountable which have a lot to do with being able to challenge your brother, question him, uh, ask him to check himself, to evaluate what he's doing, and such like. And yet in the same breath we're saying, uh, if that's what, what we espouse, and then say, that, oh, you know, we're afraid to do that uh, in any area. So I, I think that's a, an inconsistency there because I'm sure we are encouraged as men to finally speak up. Men in church uh, for years because of being afraid uh, of someone knowing who they really are in Jesus Christ. Uh, we've been afraid to let other men know that we're not perfect. And therefore, we keep coming to church every Sunday putting on a facade that says, Oh, I'm Joe Christian, and uh, you know I'm pretty neat instead of being real and saying, Listen, you know I'm a Christian, and, and, and I'm doing my best, but I'm not perfect. And, and, and I would like to have someone to pray with, someone to pray with me with. And so uh, accountable relationships means that there's going to be some confrontation. There's going to be some conflict because you're going to try and be a true brother and not just a, a, a fake or facade uh, of a Christian or a Christian relationship. And so I, I, I think that that's kind of inconsistent where we're encouraging men to be real with one another, and at the same time, then we say, well, we're not real, we're, we're shying away from conflict. Well, let me say this. The, the, the fact is, I think Mr. Davies has been reading too much uh, Robert Hicks and the phallic kind of Jesus books. I, I've never, 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 never read, read the book. And the Garden Darbies and all the uh, literature that is perpetrated by the Promise Keepers uh, groups. In fact, he talks about his wife. I had a lady call in on one of the programs I was on the other day, and she said, well, my husband's had a deep work of God in his life through this. I said, well, well, let me ask you this. If you were going into a situation where you knew your husband was sitting down with a bunch of other men and getting in one of these accountability sessions and uh, talking uh, about things like, and then I read her some of the questions out of the PK handbook material called the icebreakers that they give to the small group leaders to loosen up men. It tells the group leader to tell, tell the men this, quote, our culture has many initiation rites. By the way, that's a new age spin word, as is most promise keepers materials inundated with it. But anyway, it says, our culture has many initiation rites to manhood associated with the phallus. Which have you experienced? Do you have a story to share with these other men about pubic hair growth? Your first really and I'm not going to say some of this, it's too embarrassing, but your first really uh, embarrassing moment with a girl, uh, when you were potty trained, your first dating experience, your wedding night, the conceiving of your first child, 
I mean, this is sick stuff. There's nothing godly about this, Mr. Davies. Okay. Well, ask, well, tell him well, let him respond game. to that. I, I, tell him I about your honestly, people bingo game. I, I can honestly say, once again, I've been involved since 1994. Uh, you know, that's not anything that, that I've discussed. I've trained uh, hundreds of men in the St. Louis area. I think everything must be done with, with decorum and some balance, uh, common sense, um, just just as a, as a term. Um, and so I, I haven't uh, seen any icebreakers like that. I haven't uh, read from uh, the book that uh, asked us to do that. It's on your tables. I don't think they're selling it anymore, are they, Robert Hicks, a masculine journal? They're still letting out the handbook. I'm sorry? They're still releasing and using the handbook. Okay. And that's what that's out of. All right. Let, really let's, ta let's take a call from Kathy. She's on a car phone. Good morning, Kathy. Welcome to Mornings with Tim and Al. Yes, gentlemen. Uh, enjoying your program once again. Thanks Thank you. a lot for, for having this. But my experience with the church and with, the, uh, with men within the church, they are still, they're spiritual Christians and they're still living secret lives. And I think it's the best thing to be accountable and to talk to other men that they could pray for one another because our men are not strong like they're supposed to be. And God wants strong men. He wants men with integrity. He wants men that will stand with Jesus Christ. And I think the biggest problem today is we've, we've buried those men and we are not letting uh, Christ come through them and the men that they're supposed to be. So I kind of go, go along with promise keepers. I don't know the hierarchy, but I know those that are within it that are trying to help these men, and I know that most denominations are against it, but they don't realize that their men are weak and they're failing. And, Phil, there's, there's a problem. because I, I know a Christian man who's in prison for child uh, molesting. I know uh, Christian men who have problems with pornography. I know Christian men who, who still smoke pot and, and who are terrible parents. And you know a lot of folks, we're, we're so into what we do, working 60, 80 hours a week, that we neglect our wives, we neglect our children. Uh, the Christian family is falling apart. And maybe Promise Keepers isn't doing it uh, uh, 100% uh, the way they should, but is, is, isn't this better than nothing? Let me answer it like this. Number yeah. one, our definition of a Christian, uh, biblically speaking, is very loose. Uh, uh, you, you talk about child abusers and, and dope smokers. You know, Paul names all of these in a long list and said, none of these abusers of mankind shall inherit the kingdom of God. They've obviously not have a changed nature, and they are not operating under the premise of a biblically born-again Christian. They have claimed the name of Christian. They're members of churches, but to, to say they're Christians is... is it's, it's a joke. It's, you, you, biblically speaking, you'd have no ground to make that assertion and to stand on it. But would you... The evidence of a born-again person being born of the Spirit in their life. Now, just because some people and even some churches mm -hmm. have not per performed the uh, application of, of the Scriptures, and I challenge you want to go read Ephesians 4 if you want to know, everything the Promise Keeper is trying to do is a redundancy of what the local church and men of God are supposed to to be doing. And when it comes to women, uh, you know, someone asked Randy Phillips, the president of Promise Keepers, why they exclude women. He said, well, men need to get real with each other and let down the barriers. Now, let me say something. There's not a person in this world a man ought to get more real with than his wife. And this is a divisive activity. It's nothing bringing together unity. What it does, one man called it uh, a well-known preacher in this country called it the sissification of men, and it, 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 it does the opposite of what it claims to be doing. Let me uh, let me ask you this, Phil: Are you able <clears throat> to share with your wife everything that you would share with another believer, male believer? Um, yeah, if I was, I mean, my wife is my best friend. Well, mine too, and and Al's too. Yeah. I mean, not well, I had an example. Uh, yesterday, I was at Chinooks. I was doing some grocery shopping. And uh, it's 90 degrees outside, 90% humidity, and there are girls walking around the, the supermarket aisles wearing things that are rather flimsy. Now, I am born again. I have a new nature. The problem is Al Gross every once in a while comes out and notices these girls in these flimsy outfits, and my wife saw me noticing. <laughs> and fortunately, <laughs> you were interceding for them, weren't you? Uh, <laughs> boy, good to God, I need to pray for that girl. Now, here's the problem. We were talking about child uh, abusers and people who smoke dope and stuff. The, the problem with me is... That's a far is, cry from looking at a woman and lusting. You know. Yeah, oh, well, but but see, Al Gross still follows me around. Al Gross, is, I'm born again, but but the flesh every once in a while says, hey. <laughs> every day, mine yeah. is. It's yeah. a choice. You make the choice of who's going to control your life, but the propensity is toward the Lordship of Christ. 
and less and less is sin to have domination in our life. And more <laughs> the biblical principles in the church and our ministry and association there, the less of us manifest. The question is this, though, Phil. Would it be easier to say to a, a brother in the Lord, would you pray for me? I have this problem of yeah. lust. Or would it be easier to say that to your wife, well, what, who's struggling with her self-image and, uh, mm. you know, what do you mean you're having a problem with lust? Well, if your wife's struggling with self-image, you obviously are not fulfilling your ministry to her, number one, so you need to pay attention to that. Number two, there are things that you may prefer to deal with with another man, but that doesn't preclude the fact that there are men in your church mm -hmm. who love you and care about you and will have a walk with God, and that can be used for that kind of bouncing off, including including your pastor. Let me tell you what Promise Keepers is becoming. It is becoming a religious heroine, a religious dope fix for many people who do not want to be disciplined to walk in biblical Christianity and to apply biblical pr principles. It is an organization that is co uh, covertly and overtly, and by their own admission and by the publication of their materials, are radically committed to the mixing of the psychology of Freud and Jung and Christian psychology with biblical principles. And I want you to know the two shall never meet. There will never be a harmony between light and darkness. Psychology is a religion that is based on humanism. Christianity is a, is a truth based on the life of Christ and the Word of God. You cannot mix those two. Promise Keepers has done that. You add the, the ingredient that it is formed by the men out of the vineyard organization who believe by their own statements in extra-biblical experiences, extra-biblical revelation, extra-biblical pronouncements, and you look at the bizarre antics and activities that are going on represented through the vineyard movement, and it ought to raise the eyebrows of every even charismatic and Pentecostal person in this country. Let me ask this of Bill. Uh, Bill, uh, I, I've never been to a Promise Keepers. This will be the first one I've, I've ever okay. attended. Uh, my my question is this: uh, Is what he's saying about men sharing these these personal experiences, their first sexual experience, are these things true? That men do this with one another there? No. I, okay. I, I, when you come to a conference, I, I think some of the greatest things that happen, besides men of different races and cultures and different uh, denominations who normally would not sing the praises to the Lord together, who normally would not see one another in, in the context of a, of, a, of a worship setting, men who are so much segregated so that on their jobs they would rather seek out a, a, a black man to witness to an a unsaved black man or seek out a white man to witness to an unsaved white man because of the lack of relationship and sensitivity. And, and, and so uh, I think what you will find are men, you know, who may be Baptist and, and Lutheran and, and what have you, uh, men that, that are be um, Hispanic and, and white and black, Hello. together for the first time. Okay. And I challenge Mr. Baby. together. And, and not asking, you know, when was your first sexual experience? No, I don't think well, that's, that's what you're going to find. That's part of the problem. I, I challenge you, number one, Mr. Davies, in all due respect, to read the book, Another Trojan Horse, and secondly, to compare it to the facts as you know them. Thirdly, to go look at the tables that y'all have at your organization's rallies. And by the way, the big rallies, most people will enjoy them. I enjoy them. You go with these big rallies, they are, they are put together for the purpose of soliciting people to be drawn into the organization. They are very intellectually designed to stroke the, uh, the common experience and the big emotional a gathering of when you put 50 or 60,000 people together on any common experience, be it a, a church meeting, a Billy Graham meeting, or a Super Bowl, okay. you're going to have a commonality of spirit and, and hype. I have got to go. Phil, okay, Phil, go I ahead. Give us, a, give us a phone number where people can call for more information about the uh, the, the book. Well, I, we've only got a few of these books left okay. right now. They're going to have to wait. If they don't get an order in today, they're going to have to wait a while. But the number they can call today for the book, and I, I, if, uh, when I get off, if you'll ask Mr. Davey for his address, I'll mail him a complimentary copy. Sure, he sure. Okay. I, I, again, pray that I didn't show... No, I thought David you did well. You, you, were fine. you did fine. My intent, it's just difficult to go into dialogue like this without bantering around and sure. the man in politics. The, uh, okay, go ahead and give us that phone number. Used to that. Our number, 1-800-829-9673. 1-800-829-9673.
1-800-273-8473. We've yeah. only got a few of those left, okay. uh, a couple hundred, but uh, the first ones call and get it, and they call Visa MasterCard in order so they can get the address to order it. And thank you so much for having me. I wish thank I had you. more time. I'd be glad to come back again. Mr. Davies, thank you for your kindness. And uh, the policy of PK up until now has been that they would not allow anybody to come on with us, and I appreciate your openness and your honesty and your kindness, Mr. Davies. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Phil. Phil right. Arms. Uh, uh, Bill? Yes. Okay, now, uh, there. You know, I saw on Saturday's paper there were 45,000 tickets sold. How many are available? Oh, I, I, that would mean, I think the dome holds around, oh, 60,000 or so. 60 is in uh, six? Six oh? 60,000. 60,000, okay. Yeah, that, would, that would be my estimate. And what number do they call for more information? Well, for more information, they can dial 351 uh, 5141 or 1 800. Seven five nine five. We have that number. One eight hundred eight 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 seven five nine five. I'd like to make a, a comment, please. Sure, sure. Go ahead. And and, and this is something I think is important, mm -hmm. and that is, Promise Keepers is not a denomination. And I think many of the arguments uh, come from persons trying to make Promise Keepers into a denomination, and then let's start a denominational fight. Mm -hmm. Many of the crit criticisms that come can also be said from one denomination to the other. I think if, if, we, if Promise Keepers were a denomination, the same thing would happen. Since Promise Keepers is seeking to bring men together of all Christian denominations, we have much more of a middle of the road um, attitude. We're not called to be a denomination. We're called to be a ministry, a vehicle to be used uh, by the body of Christ to bring men together and to help men grow in Jesus Christ. Let's and, take one more phone call. We've got Stu calling from uh, Belleville, Illinois. Welcome to Mornings with Tim and Al and Bill Davey. Good morning, Stu. Hello. Um, Mr. Arms is gone, so I guess I can't ask him, but I was going to ask him if he's ever been to a Promise Keeper Stadium event. He said he had. Yeah. Did not? He said he had been, and yeah. that he was uh, he was impressed that mm -hmm. it it uh, uh, it's it's very exhilarating. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I guess the only words I would say, since uh, you guys were just making some of the points I wanted to make, but I think people should heed the words of Gamaliel in, in Acts five thirty eight and thirty nine. It says, "Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail." But if it is God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. We always, though, Stu, have to be open to uh, constructive criticism. Uh, we are, uh, the Apostle Peter didn't go after Paul when Paul withstood him to the face. Uh, as Christians, we're to rebuke and exhort one another. And I appreciate it. Uh, some of the letters that we've received have been very uh, helpful to us. And, and help keep us on track, and, and we need that as believers, and so we should always remain open to criticism. Whether you love Promise Keepers or, or you're opposed to it, you need to read that book, Promise Keepers, Another Trojan Horse by Phil Arms, and ask yourself, okay, Lord, um, help me to, to see this from your eyes, help me to read this objectively, because Jesus did say, uh, beware of false prophets. And, uh, you know, you, you, you have to, we, we, we can set aside minor things like pre-trib and post-trib, but when it comes to the issue of salvation, uh, when people are saying, uh, I believe that uh, baptism saves, that's where you have to draw the line, because keep in mind the Judaizers in Galatians believed God, they believed in Jesus, and they believed in the Word. It's what they believed in addition to that that earned them Paul's anathema. He said, I would that you would... I, uh, if, if one comes to you preaching any other gospel than what I've preached to you, let him be a curse, let him be anathema, let him be damned. So we have to be careful. And I don't think there's anything wrong with raising questions and, and, and being like the Bereans and searching these things out from the Word. Thank you so much for your call, Stu. And uh, Bill, thank you once again. It was good okay. to meet you. I look forward to I seeing you. I appreciate you guys. And uh, I'd, I'd like to say that the, the, the first, uh, I think the great commandment says to... Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's right. And I think the second part of it has something to do with relationship. Mm -hmm. Love uh, your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, one of my questions is, if everything it only uh, relies on the truth of God's Word, I think the truth of God's Word says we must first be in relationship with God. And then the other part says, is like unto this, that we, should, we must be in relationship with through God, with one another. That's right. That's right. Hey, thank you, my friend. Okay. Look forward to seeing you on the 18th. All right. God bless. Bye-bye, Bill. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, what do you want? 
Deborah. Be nicer to them. Hi, Hi Deborah. Deborah. How are you? What hast thou to do with us, thou Deborah Peppers of the afternoon? Have you come <laughs> to torture us before your time? Well, I was going to give you a secret number because my buddy, Ralph English, was yes. in concert last night at the uh, church in Belleville since Stu just yeah. called in from Belleville. Mm. And I just woke her up, and yeah. she's on her way back to the airport, and I said, I've got two good buddies. Yeah. I'd love to call you and talk to you just for a couple of minutes well, on air. We're Christians, and we don't believe in secret numbers or handshakes <laughs> or, uh, yeah, or ceremonies. Yeah, number. So, Tim, you go in the other room, and you can talk to her. <laughs> okay. Take it in the bathroom break. <laughs> All right. Now, did you line up an interview for us? I did, just but she's, and she's only going to be here for about another hour, so I told her that you would call her and talk to her real quick. Oh, good, okay. Hour. All right, so uh, we shall take... If you would like. Yes, absolutely. Okay, now, was she on your program on Friday? No, because she just got in yesterday. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. But now, Stu just called from Belleville. I don't know if he heard about it. It was sold out. She was 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock, <clears throat> excuse me, at the yeah. United Church of Christ in Belleville yesterday, mm -hmm. and she said... Well, I'll let her tell you about it. But all right, you're going to give us the number on the air for uh, before mm -hmm. God and all these witnesses, or no, are you going she's to... staying in a convent. <laughs> There's a motel <laughs> in or hotel. I don't know which it is yes. in Belleville. It was an old convent that's right. been converted, so that's where she is. But I'm going to give you her number off air. All right. But in the meantime, may yes. I ask one question? I know Phil yes. is gone. Yes. yes. But the question I would ask, since in First Corinthians nine twenty two, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means, save some. Mm -hmm. I would like for him to tell what it is that he's doing to save some other than um, going against the promise keepers, which you're right, we should do and find out all things, you know, that are happening. But what would he do then with 